Yeah, we're 15 minutes ahead of what we usually are? Okay. And, you know, the empty seats are a testimony to our efforts here to, <laughs> to do this. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so many things that we have looked at um, over the last few weeks, uh, looking at the, at the human brain and, and uh, the things that we discussed with one another about epiphany and uh, epiphysis and booth and all of these different things. And what I wanted to suggest today is, is the Bible then speaking to us entirely about the operation of the brain? I mean, is there anything in here that's literal, or is this entirely a text about the anatomy as it relates to the universe, our harmony between us and the stars and the universe and so forth and so on? If you look on page 25 of the material that you have there, you, of course, see um, a very interesting thing, which, which began this whole idea that we, be we began our search with this, because in Exodus 26.33, the Bible specifically gives us directions on construction of the tabernacle. It says you'll make an outer court, you'll make an inner court, and you'll separate the two by a curtain. Well, when we look at the human brain, we see that the outermost layer is dura mater, the innermost layer is pia mater, and between the outer dura mater and pia mater lies a reticulated layer of tissue called arachnoid, which means the web or the curtain. So that coincidence then gave us license to start looking and saying, wow, if this indeed is true, and, and, and it certainly would appear from that that the Bible in talking about constructing the tabernacle according to a pattern, was actually talking about the construction of the human brain. This is a significant thing. And so then, of course, as we started to look, as you remember, and you've been with us, from, and you'll see all of these things in the documentation around the tapes, we entered into the tabernacle of the Bible, and the first thing that we ran into was cherubims. And so then we entered into the brain, and the first thing that we entered into or found was cerebrum. So then everything was stuck. And then we looked at the construction of the words between cherubim and cerebrum. And, and what does cherubim do? They cover the holy place. And the word cerebrum, the word cere means to cover. So then we started to see all of these things and say, gosh, uh, is, is, this, is this true? Maybe the Bible, maybe the Bible is, a, is a coded text about the operation of the human body and how it can harmonize and communicate with the universe and with what we call God, then, then we've really come upon something that is amazingly beautiful. And, and that would be very, very consistent. If we're saying that the tabernacle is the brain and that cherubim are actually the cerebrum of the brain, then it's very consistent with a couple of scriptures we want to look at. Open to the Bible to page 853. And, and uh, they're back there. If you look at page 853, you look at Luke chapter 17, and in verse 21 of Luke chapter 17, Jesus is given the following words to say, the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is within you. Well, that's what we're saying. We're saying that the tabernacle is the brain, the cherubim or the cerebrum. So the kingdom is within you. And then look at page 1014. And on page 1014, you come to Revelation chapter 21. And in Revelation chapter 21, look at verse 3. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. That means mankind. It doesn't mean men as opposed to men and women. The tabernacle. And so that's what we're saying. The tabernacle is the outer court, the inner court, and the, and the curtain is arachnoid, dura mater, pianor. It's with us. And look what it says. <laughs> Behold, the tabernacle is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. He will dwell with them. And God shall be with them. Say, not up in the sky. Not, not up in a, in a UFO. Not anywhere like that. Inside of you. And so then all of the structures and all of the words we read in the Bible bear out our assumptions here, which we're documenting for you. And we're documenting all of these assumptions, not with any New Age books, not with any books that are anything but prestigious medical dictionaries and, and, and scientific works and encyclopedias. But let me ask you then, if this is true, and all of this is happening inside of the brain, then... What about, 
What about the crucifixion? What about the resurrection? What about them? I mean, let me tell you, let's say, for instance, there is somebody named God somewhere. And you belong to a cult that has said this. This person called God is incapable of forgiving anybody unless he tortures people to death and watches blood flow. That's what we've said. And I and you, we've all gone into buildings where we've been taught this. God cannot forgive anybody unless he brutally murders somebody. Oh, and you say, well, yes, but what, what the heck? I mean, after all, the story is that he gave himself. But wait a minute. <coughs> There's a catch to this. If God had been big enough to build a cross and then send cosmic nails down through the sky to nail himself up to the tree, I'll buy that. But he didn't. He used hitmen to do this. He used hitmen to do this. Because even on the cross, Jesus is saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. If they knew that they were nailing God up on a tree, do you think they would have died? I don't think so. And so this is a terrible thing. And, and what really concerns me about it is our cult, which has created this story for us, has indeed caused us all to be guilty of something called blasphemy. That is blasphemy. To say that the creator of pussycats and dolphins and gorgeous places like, what was it, Astagma, Mexico, and all of these wonderful places that we go to, is incapable of a simple act of forgiveness without resorting to violence. And that's what we've said. And that's, our, that's the foundation of our religious culture. It certainly is. So if we begin to learn then that the reason Jesus is crucified is because on December the 21st, the sun enters a constellation called the Southern Cross. When we understand that, and then it moves into the tomb of the winter solstice, December 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, and then on December the 25th, through the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born. When we begin to understand that this is all astronomical, then we say, my goodness, this is beautiful. And not only is it astronomically beautiful in the sky, because what does it do? When the sun resurrects on December 25th out of the solstice, it rises to sit at the right side in the northern hemisphere. If you pick up any scientific astronomical magazine, astrological magazine, you'll find something that's called RA, which is the movement, the apparent movement of the sun, and RA means celestial right ascension, because the sun appears to move out of the bounds of the earth in the southern hemisphere in an ascension to the right, to sit at the right hand of power and bring a spring. That's Passover. All, this whole thing, I'll tell you something, and I've told you this time and time again, if on December 25th First, the sun entered a constellation called Taurus, Jesus would have been gored to death by a bull. If the constellation was Leo, he would have been eaten by a lion. If the constellation was Aquarius, he would have had a pitcher of water broken over his head. <laughs> and so this is a great astronomical theme. I mean, why can't we be adult and understand that? Now, last week, what did we do? We looked at the resurrection because it was the glorious, wonderful day of Easter, named after that beloved prostitute, Esther of Babylon. <laughs> we don't want to forget her. When in the temples of Babylon, the ladies used to come to church with only their Easter bonnet on because there was work to do. But they did, and that's our holy day. We don't want to. We don't want to forget that. But we considered. We considered the woman who came to the tomb. And if you remember in the story, the woman who came to the tomb was Mary Magdalene. And she came to the tomb. She was the first one at the tomb. Say. So then you have to say to yourself, why was she the first one at the tomb? What's the big deal about this? Well, first of all, if you look on page 14 of the material that I've given you, and you all should have page 14, and if you look at page 14 of that material, 
you'll find that you run into the word fornix. And fornix is a structure in the center of your brain, okay? And fornix, if you look at it, there's two words that I want you to kind of put in your head for today. One is the arch vault, see that? And the other is a vault-like space. So it's an arch vault. And then if you turn the next page, and if you go to page 14b, you'll see that word vault. And vault to roll away, remember roll away the structure. Look at an arched structure, and then look it down to A, which I have underlined, a burial chamber. So if, if indeed the fornix is the burial chamber of Jesus, so forth, Amon, as we know, amen, the place in the pyramid of Amon, and, and all of these things, because remember in the hippocampus of the brain, that structure that's called Amon's <coughs> horn and so forth that we talked about. But there is an interesting point there, because now we're going to look at this... Um, you know what I want to do? I want to give this stuff out, Joan, and I, I forgot to do that, but um, I, had a pr I printed it in a little bit smaller print, and uh, if you're like me, it's a little difficult to read, but uh, you should have to have a little uh, burdens on you for this, all of this stuff you're getting for nothing. Because I couldn't jam it. I didn't want to make any more pages than we already had. But if you'll not try to read that, you'll be a big help to me because I'll guide you along in reading it and uh, otherwise, because I got it all over the place. There's nothing that you read there that, that goes in, you know, one order or the other. But what I wanted you to look at is the fact of this. Mary Magdalene was a woman, according to the Bible, who had seven devils driven out of her. The seven devils driven out of Mary Magdalene are actually speaking of the seven chakras <laughs> which are opened by the power of the Kundalini. The seven chakras which are open are actually the seven devils. But this is the point. Mary Magdalene was known in the traditional circles of, of Scripture as a prostitute. All right? She was known as a, as, as a prostitute. Well, then, why would she... Now, now when, you're, when you're doing things like this, when you're exploring into allegory and myth, you don't look for truths. You look for connections of words. Why would she be the first one at the fornix? Okay? Well, the reason is, if you look at the page, you, you look at the very page 57 at the very bottom of the stuff that I gave you, you'll see something interesting. You'll see the word... If you see what it says, last week we considered the resurrection, so forth and so on. You see the word fornicate. And the word fornicate, you'll see the word fornix, arch, or vault. And so then we have, okay, the prostitute, who is Mary Magdalene, who is the first one to arrive at the vault or the tomb, which is the fornix or the place of fornication. And the connection is made then as to why she is the first one there. All right? So that, just, just hold that for a minute. What we did here is we, we developed a relationship with somebody by the name of her. All right? Now, let me tell you something, and I don't think we have any children in, uh, the, in the room here, and most of you can handle this, all right? See that word, her? There's a, a word that you use sometimes to describe prostitutes. Okay, yes, some of you even know it. <laughs> All right, so let's look at something. Let's look at something. But, but I want you to understand, there's a duality. The seven chakras unopened can be a source of problems for you. The pineal and pituitary in a degenerative state can be a source of problems for you. In a regenerated state, they're a source of God. This which is her or whore and also be that which is virgin. And I'll show you this. Okay. It depends. So, so in other words, the situation is a duality. Our problems from the mind or our s the same salvation from the mind regenerated through meditation. All right? So we develop this relationship on page 349 of your Bible. And on 349, uh, you come to a, a, a seldom used book. We don't look at this book too often because... You know, it, it's, it's kind of statistics more than anything. Um, but it's a, it's a book of First Chronicles. And there's something very interesting in it. And this is what's interesting.
You find in um, First Chronicles chapter 4, let me, let me get where I'm supposed to be here for just a second, because I, I lost my place. But, uh, huh? Okay. Uh, no, I know, I, ga I gave you the right page, but let me, uh, let me find where I'm supposed to be here. Um, okay, in First Chronicles, First Chronicles chapter 4, look at verse 4. And in verse 4, you, you, get, you get, and Penuel, the father of Gedor and Ezar, the father of Husha. These are the sons of Hur. Okay? So you have a relationship between Penuel, P-E-N-U-E-L. Now that word is used twice in Genesis 32. In Genesis 32, 30, Jacob says, I have seen God face to face. I shall call the place Peniel. But he also, at the same time, refers to it as Peniel. And if you look up, you know, in, in Bible dictionaries, you'll find that, that Peniel, Peniel, Peniel are all the same thing. And actually, they're talking about the Peniel gland of the brain, the single eye, the place where, you know, where God is seen. So, but what's interesting about this is look who, uh, uh, Peniel, the father, these are the sons of her. So Peniel gives birth excuse me, her gives birth to the pineal gland of the brain and also to the, uh, Ephrata, the father of Bethlehem. So there's a connection then between the woman who is both the whore, if you would, and the virgin, and I'll show you the virgin, and the pineal gland and Bethlehem, the birthplace of Christ. And I still, and I know you can't take these words out of context, but I still, I'm still interested in the fact of the word Bethlehem because I know it means house of bread, but if, as you understand, the hippocampus of the brain, the hippocampus of the brain is defined for you in your scripture, in your stuff here at six, page 16b, as the medial margin or hem of the cortical, which is the outer mantle, the hem of the garment. And Inasmuch as Beth means house and Lay means the and hem, it's interesting to me. But anyhow, so her is both, uh, has a child by the name of Peniel and a child by the name of Bethlehem. So the way to the point of Christ and the birthplace of Christ is contained both within that name, her. Now, let's look at page 31 of the material that I gave you as we consider her from the Arabic name. In fact, I, I was, when I was in New York last time, as a Sufi Muslim there, and we were talking, and I, I, he, he, um, when he was talking about Kundalini, um, he said, uh, this is the, 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 feminine, the feminine serpent. And I said, yes, the dark-eyed woman, her. He said, ah. Because he knew from the Koran. And, and this is what I want to show you. If you look on page 31 uh, of, your, of your material there, you'll see on page 31, you find the word huri, H-O-U-R-E, and that is the root of the word, and this is awful on Sunday morning in the Church of God, <laughs> nonetheless, it's the word, root the word hur. Huh? Take that outside and tell your folks what you studied this Sunday morning in the Church of God. Okay, and they'll love that. Anyhow, but, uh, but, but look what we find here, all right? We find Huris, a voluptuous, alluring woman. But look what you find right below that. One of the beautiful virgins of the Quranic paradise. The Quran, the virgin. So the same who can be the prostitute within us the strange woman, which can cause us trouble in a, in a, in a, in a, when we try to take heaven by force or in a, in a disorganized state, as it becomes harmonizing with us, it becomes the virgin of the Koran. And see, notice, from the Parisian Huri, from the Arab book, her, H-U-R. So we have then, what, the, the, we, we, we find this, and, and look, something else I want to show you. Now this is interesting. We have found her to be the alluring woman or the prostitute, and we also find her to be the virgin, see? And, and, it, and it can be the duality of either one. But there's something else that's beautiful in this, too. If you look on page 56 of the material that I gave you last week, something interesting 
it comes out of a Christian dictionary. If you look towards the bottom of the page on the right-hand side, I have copied for you her a hole as of a viper, a serpent, see? As a viper, as a serpent, all right? Now, let me show you something, if I can, that's really interesting. So now we have her, who is the feminine serpent, Kundalini, the, the, the whore or prostitute, as you would, and the virgin, see? And so then it, it would lead us to this, that this energy can be... So, but, but let me show you something, what I think is extremely interesting, if you can, um, if you're with me, I hope you can see this. Al, can you um, give me a little less light for just a minute? I think I could get this on so everybody can see it. But see, I printed it big. No, that, I don't think that'll, that's not, you know, if it's in the way, I'll move it, okay? Okay. Do you see the... Do you see the word hurish? This is, I went down in the dictionary. We see this word hurish up here, okay? That's hur, all right? Now, when you get right down, what do you find next? Hurl, one of the turns of a spiral shell. Anything that circles or turns on or around something else. Ah, huh? do you see? So look, we're identifying this. We're identifying it as the serpent kundalini. We're identifying it as the prostitute Mary Magdalene, who is first to the fornix, who has the reputation of whore, if you would, and the virgin. But then when you get to that word whore, you come right down to whirl anything that circles or turns on or around something else. And what is it circling or turning around? Your spine. OK? So there's a connection then, isn't there, between the word whore, as to which this woman is attached, and the word whirl, which is the serpentine motion, and the word serpent, and the word virgin. All of them are interconnected. OK? All right. Sometimes when you find this stuff, it's, uh, it's unbelievable that it all, uh, it all shows up, but it does, okay? Now, there's another thing when you talk about, okay, if Mary Magdalene is the whore part of this, the prostitute part of this, that whirling energy, then what about the fact that also on page 31, you see this viper, uh, the material I gave you, page 31, you see the viper or the serpent, which, if you look up viper, and look down at the right part of Viper. It says to give birth. So there, that, that really, really, we're having an interesting thing here. See? So, 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 now let me show you one other thing. Mary Magdalene, we're, we're, we're kind of, I saw, I, I've looked in a Christian dictionary and they said it is absolutely terrible to consider that some people think that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. I mean, there, not, there was no woman. There wasn't even this person didn't even exist. Okay? It didn't even exist, this woman. These are all these are all mystical, allegorical tales of consciousness and the mind being written to, so that you can find these things. That's why Jesus has given the words that they seek. Find. You have to be a little bit adult to understand these things. And so when you look and here is Mary Magdalene who we're tagging with this word whore. She's the first one to get to the tomb with a vault, which is the fornix, which is the place of fornicate. Actually, in Rome, the places where the prostitutes used to ply their trade in the underground places were called forna, fornicatus. That was the name of the place. Okay? But let me show you something. <laughs> Mary Magdalene, look at page 57. You just got that today. And look at the very bottom of the page. And look at the word Magdalene. <coughs> Magdalene Mary Magdalene, considered identical with a Reformed prostitute. And then it says a Reformed prostitute. And a Magdalene is also a house of refuge or reformatory for prostitutes. See? So then all of these words interconnect. And you're getting an idea now why she's the first one at the Forex. And she is also connected with the Viper the serpent that swings and turns and so forth and so on. And this is what you're supposed to do when, when you go through all of these things to say, gee, w what is this all about, okay? So now what we have to do as adult people who are exploring and thinking about things, we have to totally abandon 
any concerns about prostitution? That's silly. These are only words. You know, I like to get George Carlin up here. So these are words. They're just words to explain things to you. They're used in metaphysical ways to explain truths to you. Is nobody a prostitute in any of this business? Let me be the first to tell you. I don't know, and I know this is hard because we don't want to offend our cult leaders. Do you know that, that, that Jim Jones' cult leader, would, those people that follow him would never offend him. David Koresh, you wouldn't offend David Koresh. And Mr. Applewhite, my God, they, they, these people died rather than offending. But I'll tell you something, the same thing goes with the cult leaders here. And may I tell you this, and I glorify God, and I reach up to the universe and to all the stars, okay? God never killed anybody. Jesus is a great living expression of life and the crucifixion is an astronomical phenomenon that occurs within us to bring us out of the pits of, of associating with these crazy people up into a realm of higher consciousness. Physical crucifixion never happened. But if you go out and you tell those people, you will totally upset the cult leaders of this cult. Oh, it's okay to talk about Mr. Applewhite and his cult, or Mr. Jones and his cult, or Mr. Koresh and his cult, because our cult doesn't like their cult. But you don't talk about our cult. But I do. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to the alluring, voluptuous woman, we have Mary, who is the virgin of the Koran. So, so when we've looked up and we've seen the relationship of, of, of the, the dark-eyed woman, the alluring woman, but we've seen the virgin, one of the things I want you to think about, let's, let's, let's get away from the, well, her is also, you know, we've, we've got the connection, we've, we've taken care of the whore part of this program, so now we can go to the nice, pretty part of the virgin part of the program, which is Mary, pretty Mary. The virgin. Okay. And one of the things, we're not going to spend too much time here, but we will down the road. One of the things that you want to understand about consciousness, and see, when you come in and you are operating here in, in your meditation, then it is that feminine serpent that moves up through the virgin consciousness, and then Mary takes you up to where? To Bethlehem. And how does she get? She takes you on the donkey, on your stubborn nature, into Bethlehem, into the house of, of the hippocampus, the house, the place of the hem where the Christ is born. That's the beautiful part of the story. See? So when we look at that, I want you to understand something. You don't have to go there, but in Luke one thirty, Mary, the virgin, receives instructions of the birth coming within from the angle. The angle of light. The angel of light, Gabriel. And I always wonder, Gabriel is the talking angel. When anything, anything is to be said, Gabriel shows up. Gabby. Oh, wow. What are they going to do there? Are they just going to sit around and gab? So where do these words come from? But they're nice. It's interesting. Okay, but anyhow, her, she becomes the one who receives from the angle of light, which is the electromagnetic field, from, and we'll talk about that in a minute, of this great thing that is going to happen within, which is the birth of the Christ in Bethlehem, which we understand now to be the place of, of the hymn. Okay, now, what happens then? As her, the serpent, winds its way. Look, you, go to, you, you people go to a doctor. I go to a doctor. We have a very good doctor. We enjoy going to the doctor. Doctor keeps us well and all this kind of business, and that's wonderful. But when you go to your doctor and you think of her, the serpent, whirling around the spine, up, look on the lapel of your doctor's coat, and he has the picture of her. It's the caduceus. That is your spine. And the serpent winding up. And the serpent winding down. The DNA, the caduceus. And that's what it is. And it's Mary. And it can be either, either the, the prostitute. But it, remember, Mary Magdalene is only a prostitute. 
only a whore to your life until the seven devils are cast out, until the seven chakras are open. Then she becomes the one who comes to the fornix, to the tomb, to see a man who has risen. That's good. That's good stuff. So she comes to the fornix, Mary Magdalene. And what she sees is a man has left the fornix. Now remember, as you look in 16b of your material, you have a structure in your brain called Amon's horn. And remember, Amon is the ram head god. And we found a couple weeks ago that you bring down the walls surrounding Jericho by taking up the ram's horn, which means the hippocampus of the brain. See? Remember, too, that we understand that the hippocampus of the brain is the place of memory and the place of the location of the ram. And so now we've all realized that we have a computer up here that doesn't need more religion, but needs more ram. We need more memory. And when we get that ram, when we get that memory, we'll start to understand, we'll start to realize these things of who we are, where we came from, who is, quote, unquote, God, and all of these kind of things. But this was the interesting thing. So, and, and then we found out also that in the book of Revelation, Jesus is called Amen. So even our born-again friends really can't have any trouble with this, but that's the way it is. It's inside their head, too. But anyhow, Amen has left the fornix, and where has he gone? Because she has come. She is no longer the whore. She is now the virgin, and she has come winding upward, upstria pinealis, to the fornix of the brain, and what is, the, what is the energy that is in the fornix of the brain? According to your Stedman's Medical Dictionary and the material that you have, it's for amen. Right? And you have that in there. I, I forget what's on page 10 of where it is. So she comes up, and she comes to the fornix of the brain, and she finds out that amen has left. Where did he go? Oh, he's gone. And so what do we think of? What do you and I think of? Oh, she came to the tomb, and the stone was rolled away, and there was a big fat angel sitting on the tomb with a white sheet in his hand, and said, what the hell are you looking for, lady? What are you looking for? So, now, we're going to grow up, and we're going to become mature, and we're going to realize that what had happened here was an angle of light had caused an activity in the fornix of the vault of us, of our brain, and had opened energy so that our men who was entombed in our fornix could now move throughout the brain. See, it doesn't make any difference how old you are. It doesn't make any difference how sick or debilitated you are. If the angle of light causes the stone to roll away, it's a whole new ballgame. It's all new. And, 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 and now you're, you're, you're finding like all these documentations that we've given you from the hospitals and Al's talking about USA Today and so forth and so on. So here she comes and she finds that a man has left the fornix. A man has moved. Where? Where did he go? And she's quoted as saying, what have they done with him? I don't know where he is. I where the hell did he go? Okay, so you go on page 804 and he specifically told you where he was going to go. If you look on page 804, and you look at Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26, okay? And Matthew tw chapter 26, verse 32, there are the words as to where he was going to go. He said, look, uh, after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Right? I will go before you into Galilee. Okay, fine. So we have come up to the fornix. He is gone. See, the energy now has caused the fornix to open, and Amen is now moving into Galilee. So we have to find out where Galilee is. So let's look at page 56 of the material that I gave you. You look at page 56 of the material that I gave you, and you'll find on page 56 of the material that I gave you, uh, about midway down where it says Matthew 27 before you go into Galilee, look over to the right because I've clipped out of a Christian dictionary the fact that the word Galilee means circuit. It means circuit. Whoa, wow is right. I mean... Do you realize that God and all of these cookie angels or whoever these people are up there are sitting up there saying, you know, I think somebody's getting onto this stuff. 
and, I, and, I, and we should be. But look what it says. A closed circular line, or look at electronics, a closed path followed, or being capable of a followed by an electric current. And look at the derivatives, important derivatives, circuit, and then go down to EI, ion. Whoa, an important derivative of the word circuit is the word ion. Come on, look at me, look at me. An important derivative of the word circuit is ion. Let's put an OR next to it. Come on. Who's telling you something here? Say, journey. Well, he says, I will go before you. A journey. <laughs> but this is better. Look at page 57. Uh, uh, where, wherever I am. Where, where did I, uh, page 56. Page 56. And not only do we find, uh, uh, um, is that where it is? <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, 57? Circuit? Okay, yeah, uh, page 57, ion, important deri EI, important derivatives of circuit, ion, but then look what happens. You welcome back into the fold your Hindu brothers and sisters, Hinayana, Mahayana, and Sanskrit, Yanham, the way in Buddhism, ion is the mode of, uh, the circuit rather, is the mode of knowledge, the vehicle, the way. And didn't Jesus say in Matthew 7, 14, the way is narrow, and few there be who find it. And what is the way? According to this, the circuit is the Buddhist mode of knowledge, the vehicle, the yanham, the way, the ion. All of these words interrelated with one another. So the way, then, is the circuit to the brain. So we see the possibilities there, which is, which is really interesting. And, and you know, the other thing that I, I want to I wanna do before we, 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 we move out of there, I got a little bit confused as to where we were, but if you look on page 57 of the material that I gave you today, where you see the word circuit, and then you see it embracing the word ion, and the word, and, and Buddhism, the way, and, you know, this is, the, this is the amazing thing. How can these people who are teaching this religious stuff not see this stuff? This stuff isn't in any New Age journals. This stuff is in dictionaries and encyclopedias. It's all there. How come a guy in the encyclopedia knows that circuit, which is the word Galilee, means it's the same as the Buddhism, it means the way? And, and you know, if you see that word I on there, look at that. An atom or a group of atoms that have acquired an electric charge. So now we have, you know, come back to the very, and who's in the center? Amon, and what is another name of Amon who lives in the hippocampus, who was in the hippocampus? Atom. Atom is another name of Amon. So we see the possibilities then of Mary being the first to the tomb the kundalini as the font. So the serpent and the dark, alluring woman of which Jesus drove out seven devils, see? Eh? And it says in, in Mark uh, 16, 9, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he drove out seven devils. Now, the seven devils are the seven chakras. They're the seven seals. When they're sealed, they're devils. Do you know, and I know you know, there are no such things as devils. Please know that. There is no devil? Is this something? And I, do you know, I could say Jesus is a fakata. They don't care. But if I say there's no devils, don't you dare say there's no devil. I've had people say to me, how dare you? You're going to hell for saying there's no devil. He's going to get you. There is none. But this is all consciousness. When the seals are sealed, it's the devil. Everything is going wrong. We got sickness. We got all of the confusion. We got all of the terrible things. But when those seven seals are open is when the whore has been turned into a virgin. When the seven seals are open, the seven devils are cast out, see? Look, let me show you what the seven seals are. Go to page 1005 in the Bible and look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. Page 1005 in the Bible, Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1. And it says, And I saw in the right hand, that's the right hemisphere of the brain, of him that sat on the throne. That's your highest consciousness. A book. This is the book of life. When you were a kid, you went to school. I went to Catholic school all my life. They said the main thing you want is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. And I always thought of some guy sitting there with a book. And I say, you know, I got to go up there and he's saying, geez, I can't find it. What did you say? How do you spell that? I... 
you know, it's like when you're waiting for your credit card to be approved. You know, How come that thing ain't printing? I paid my bill. I never forget one time we went up to we were in Atlantic City and I used my MasterCard or something. And, you know, we pay. You know, we were with friends. This guy comes out. Uh, Mr. Donahue, yeah. could we see you back in the kitchen? Oh. And I mean, you feel like uh, Dillinger or, or some bad person. I'm standing back there. And then it was 20 minutes. I'm standing there cooking beans and heat and all this place. I'm in it. And finally, the lady comes out. Oh, I'm sorry we had the wrong person. They thought they caught somebody. Oh. Me. <laughs> OK. But look at that. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within. And on the back side, that's your spine, sealed with seven seals. And then the whole book of Revelation talks about opening the seals. You remember this David Koresh opening the seals? He can't open the seals. Nobody can open the seals. The seals are open from the inside by the Christ. The seals are, 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 are what happened in, in the story of the myth of Mary Magdalene, when they're driven out, see? So, so then we, we have this. So now we have connected what? We've connected ion and atom in the brain. We've connected the circuit. We've connected Galilee. We've connected Jesus, electricity, atom, and, and, and then Orion. All of this is connected. It, see, does this make it, if ion is the circuit in the brain, which the, then does it make it interesting that in the pyramids, when they made the shaft from the king's chamber, that it linked <laughs> directly to or ion? Why? See, now you're understanding that not only did they do it in the pyramids, but they did it in the Bible. And they did it in a, such a way to hide it from you. See? But let me, let me show you something that I took out of the encyclopedia and I put on page 57 for you. So take a look at it. It's right in the middle. It's in dark print. And it says encyclopedia. Do you see that? It says, the brain works somewhat like both a computer and a chemical factory. Brain cells produce electrical signals and send them from cell to cell along pathways called circuits. And where did Jesus say, when I rise, I will go before you into Galilee. And what does the word Galilee mean? Circuits. And, 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 and you've got the documentation for it. OK? All right. So the Kundalini is the electrical serpent of the spine. So as the virgin her, Mary brings us in meditation to the place where the Christ is born. And as the alluring dark-eyed woman who is set free, Mary Magdalene brings us to the fornix where Christ has riven and moved into the circuits of the brain. And then we can say with Paul, ha, for who has known the mind of the Lord? We have the mind of Christ. But now you know how. You know how. So, let's, let's conclude this. If all of this is brain activity, now, what I'm going to give you is one of those sock knockers. <laughs> Knock your socks off. If all of this is brain activity, what about the crucifixion? And I mean, I can't, I don't know about you, but Easter comes around, I don't even turn the television on. I cannot deal with this guy carrying this thing. And people are beating him over the head, and he's got blood coming down. And I turn around, and I, when I was a kid, I looked at God. I said, what's the matter with you? What is this? I could never deal with this as a little kid. Because I had a father that used to do the same thing. I mean, be, we had blood-stained walls and knives in the walls and all of this stuff from the violence. And then the only, the only visitors we ever had at the park were the Newark cops, and their boots had come in our house. And my father would then, after, you know, cutting people and terrorizing and beating people, he'd come down the stairs in his bathrobe. I'll never forget it. He'd come down like this. How are you, officers? Is there a problem? Oh, we had a complaint. Well, as you can see, officers, these people, uh, some of the kids get out of hand, but I've, I've got it under control now. Don't worry about a thing. And it wasn't like it is today. They didn't care. They just, the cops said, okay, Mr. Donahue. And they left, and they left us there. And I would be sitting in a corner saying, you know, to the cops, please, you know, do what your daddy says. And they'd leave. Because he didn't look like he was. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He didn't look like that. When the cops came, he, bang, he turned it like that. So, anyhow, 
Where does the crucifixion take place? The crucifixion takes place in Golgotha. Now, I want you to open the Bible, and I want you to look at page 806. In page 806 of the Bible, you look at Matthew chapter 27. Okay? And in Matthew chapter 27, I want you to look at verse 33. Okay? And it says in verse 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull. The place of the skull. All right? So it means skull. And who was crucified there? I want you to turn to page 981. And in page 981, look at Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. And Hebrews chapter 9, look at verse 16. You there? I, I'll slow down if, I, if you need me to. Page 981. Hebrews chapter 9, page 981. Don't worry about Hebrews chapter 9. Just look at the top of the page and go find page 981. It's easier that way. Okay? Page 981, Hebrews chapter 9. What I want you to do is look at verse 16. For where there a testament is, there also of necessity must be the death of the testator. Right? So then, Jesus would be the testator who must die. Okay? No problem with that? Then what I want you to do is open the stuff, the material that I gave you, and look at page 15. And on page 15 of the material that I gave you, you'll see where I have written down here with a little arrow pointing to it. You'll see the word testa, T-E-S-T-A. Okay? And what does the word testa mean? It means skull. So they call him the testator. And testa means skull. And the crucifixion takes place in Golgotha. And Golgotha means skull. Okay? Now, look at page 861. And we're, we're, we're just about done here. But I'm, this is, look at it. Luke chapter 23 on page 861. And on page 861, look at chapter, Luke chapter 23. And Luke chapter 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, they crucified him, the malefactors, one on his right hand and one on his left. So now we have the place called Calvary. Okay? Now, follow me in, in this one because it's interesting. I want you, if you would, look at page 57, the material that I gave you. Okay? The word Calvary is from a Latin word, Calvaria. C-A-L-V-A-R-I-A. -A -A. Calvaria means skull. All right? The word Calvaria, skull, please read it, and I gave you right out of the dictionary, out of the encyclopedia, that's from Funk and Weigel. The Latin Calvaria skull, from which comes Calvary, is a translation of the Greek word cranion. Are you seeing something? It's a Greek word cranion. If you look at the next one, you'll find the word cranium, Greek cranion. Where does this all happen in your cranium, in your head? You know, you would think I made this up if you didn't see it yourself. Yeah. Honest to God. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that's right. And there it all is. This is what, I mean... Can you imagine who's ever in some place called heaven? I don't know whether in spaceships or what, and, and, and they're sitting there saying, can't they figure this out? Because I've seen, so I used to go and I said, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I and I sang this song. It's your head! <laughs> the mountain is the high point of the earth, which is your body. Mount Calvary is the skull. 
Calvaria, skull. And that's Calvaria is a Latin translation of the word cranium, which is your cranium, your head, where the cerebrum is, where the fornix is, where all of this activity is going on. See? Now, let me just, let me do one more thing. And then remember something. Let me, I, I just show, show you two things that we're going to get to. Remember that when Jesus was going to get crucified, he didn't carry the cross up the hill. They gave it to some guy named Simon of Cyrene. Why is that? Because he can't carry the cross up the hill of the spine to your skull. You've got to do that for him. If you don't allow that, if you don't do it, he can't get up there. Do you understand that? The hill is the spine. And the Calvary is your skull, it's your head. But he doesn't carry the cross up there. And I'll tell you something else. When he died, they put his body in somebody else's tomb. He doesn't have his own tomb. He needs you to give him yours, which is the fornix. And he'll wait in the fornix of your brain until resurrection time. Okay? And that's why he had somebody else carry it for him up the hill to the skull. And that's why he lies in somebody else's tomb. And so then you say, yes, you can rest in mine until the angle opens up and you go into Galilee and then through the circuit of my city. And then the new Jerusalem will be the place where I will be saved and be one with you. There was 12 disciples. One of them betrayed Jesus. I'm going to stretch and look a little bit, but I'm, if you look on page 7 of the material, you'll see that you have 12 cranial nerves in your body, in your brain. Those are the 12 disciples. I know number 4 is named trochlear pathetic. I don't believe that that's the one. I believe that the storyline, uh, the allegory, would pick number six, abducant. Because abducant means to take away, to move away from the middle. The sixth nerve lies on the outer side of the internal, uh, what they call carotid artery. It's on the outside. It's not in with, the, you know, and, 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 and it, abduction and so forth and so on. And I think the word means that. and, and this is why I also think that there's good reason for us to consider this, and we'll explore it more as we go down, and we'll wait for more instruction. But why I like the sixth one is because in Luke 23, 44, when Jesus is dying on the cross, it says, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth. And if you look at the ninth nerve, it's the glossal pharyngeal, which is the place of the mouth, which is the place of speaking. And so there is silence all about you. You are not in a position to speak. You are not able to speak the word of God. You are not able to express until there is darkness from the sixth until the ninth. From the sixth nerve, abducant, until the ninth nerve, which is the glossal pharyngeal. And then your mouth opens. And as God said to Moses, I will give you the words to speak. It is the place of tongue, it is a place of speech. So the sixth of the twelfth affects the process of crucifixion during meditation until the energy touches the ninth from when you speak the words of universal wisdom. We didn't do bad. It's only about 1230 and we're done. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you. Bye-bye.